Good evening. I'm Paul Carice. I am the director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. We're delighted to have you with us for our annual Constitution Day lecture. When the school was launched four years ago at ASU, we were very proud to establish an annual lecture to address various dimensions of this extraordinary document and to celebrate it and host academic discussions about it. If we were meeting in person, uh, we would be distributing copies of our pocket constitution, which we think is unique in the country to have not only the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as amended, but also the Gettysburg Address and Martin Luther King's 1963 I Have a Dream Address. This uh, Constitution Day, we are very happy to be celebrating the centenary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And we feature this issue about equal political rights for women in the school civic, civic classics collection, which is a collaboration with the ASU University Library. We have in that collection a contemporary, contemporaneous 1848 newspaper printing of the Seneca Falls Declaration on Women's Equal Rights. We also have an autographed copy inscribed by Susan B. Anthony of volume four, published in 1902, of her multi-volume work co-edited with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others entitled The History of Women's Suffrage. You can get information on our annual Constitution Day lecture and prior speakers, our Civic Classics collection, all the information you would ever want about the school on our website, which is scetl.asu.scetl.edu. Um, and you can also watch some short videos on the items we have in the Civic Classics collection. But with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn now to introducing our distinguished lecturer, Ellen Du Bois of UCLA. <clears throat> She's a leading historian of women's efforts to gain the right to vote. Among her many books on the topic, her most recent, published this year, is Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote, a comprehensive history of the 75-year-long U.S. women's suffrage movement. She's also the co-author of the leading textbook in U.S. women's history, Through Women's Eyes, an American History. Professor Du Bois is going to give a presentation, including some slides, and speak for 40 to 45 minutes. We do have some time at the end of the webinar for questions from you. So during the presentation, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to send messages. Professor Carol McNamara behind the scenes will be editing those and sending them to me. So with that, Professor Du Bois, thank you very much for being with us. We know you've had a busy schedule in recent weeks and months speaking uh, on this topic, given the centenary. Thank you for being with us. Uh, my pleasure. Um, you're looking at, uh, if you can see me, can you see me? Um, you're looking at uh, the cover of my book, and I am also, I think you're still looking at Paul's handsome face, but. Um, well, I think we're seeing you, Alan. Okay. Uh, this is, I'm wearing my cover, my book cover. Okay, all done. Um, okay, I am going to be uh, giving a, a lecture today called The Surprising History of Women's Suffrage. And I am going to do my best to cover a very long period, one quarter of American history, 75 years, uh, uh, by focusing on four of the most um, I would call them surprising aspects of uh, from the beginning. Uh, four of the most surprising aspects of the uh, women's suffrage movement in the United States. So here's the first one. This will take us for the, through the first decade or so of the movement. And um, the title of this surprise is the woman's suffrage constitutional amendment that never was. Okay, this story really starts uh, in 1872 when women all over the country uh, went to their polling places and declared that they knew themselves to be voters and that they were gonna submit their votes and put them in these little see-through boxes, glass boxes, which were their ballot boxes. The most famous of these voting women, as I call them sometimes, was uh, Susan B. Anthony. You see her here in a not particularly flattering cartoon. Most cartoons of her weren't particularly flattering. Uh, she's 
portrayed here as a kind of female Uncle Sam, uh, and also kind of a bit of a man. She's sort of, uh, she's not very feminine, shall we say. Uh, not, she looks very stern, which is how she was usually portrayed. Um, on election day uh, in 1872, which was a very important election, uh, Anthony uh, went to her polling place and convinced the, uh, the poor Schlub, who was uh, controlling the polling place, uh, to let her cast her vote, her vote. This is what she told him. This is what her convincing argument was. She relied on the recently ratified four years before 14th Amendment. Now, the second section of the 14th Amendment is famous in suffrage history because it's the first part of the Constitution that refers to gender, uses the word male. But here, Anthony concentrated on the first section. And this is arguably one of the most important and highly litigated aspects of the United States Constitution. Using the beginning, she said, uh, I am a person and all persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. Therefore, I am a citizen of the United States. It's important to realize that until the 14th Amendment, there was no statement of what constituted national citizenship. This was the first. And then this section goes on to say um, that uh, national citizens have uh, equal, uh, the equal protection of the laws uh, and that no state can abridge the privileges and immunities of national citizenship. And then she went on to say, clearly, who would, but, uh, who would disagree that one of the privileges, the maybe the highest privilege, uh, privilege and immunity of sit national citizenship was the right to vote? Uh, hence, I am a voter in as much as I'm a person and a citizen. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the polling officer was convinced, or perhaps it was just that he knew she was going to vote for his candidate, uh, so he let her cast her vote. Um, she was very excited. She went home, uh, and um, I think something like two weeks later, uh, there's a knock on her door and a federal marshal, uh, an officer of the federal court system, knocks on her door and tells her she's under arrest for violation of a federal crime. There weren't that many federal crimes. This was a crime that had been part of a, an 1870 law uh, deter uh, um, meant to uh, enforce the um, 14th and 15th Amendment. And um, this law was meant to uh, make it a crime for anyone to, um, to engage in illegal voting. And it was really directed at uh, leaders of the former Confederacy to keep them from voting. Um, Anthony was arrested. Uh, they, the trial was conducted in her hometown of Rochester. Uh, it was actually conduct conducted by a member of the United States Supreme Court, the guy third from the left, the um, youngest member. It's barely, very, it's not very young. Um, she was uh, found guilty. Uh, the trial was highly controversial. And among many things that the judge did that were questionable is he kept her from appealing her case to the Supreme Court, which was extremely disappointing to her, because the point was to get the United States Supreme Court to rule on this argument that she had made and to agree that it was an accurate interpretation of the 14th Amendment. And if they had agreed to that, um, theoretically, women would become voters. Uh, but although the Supreme Court didn't hear Anthony's case, they did hear the case of this woman. Her name was Virginia Minor. She also had uh, gone to uh, her polling place uh, in 18, November 1872. She lived in St. Louis. Um, unlike Anthony, who was voting for a Democrat, she was a, uh, for a Republican, she was a Democrat. Um, she was not allowed to vote. And so she sued the polling officer who, who uh, forbade her from voting.
and this was poor Mr. Happersett. The case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And any of you who have ever studied the con a constitutional law might recognize this as the only the second case in women's rights ever to appear before the Supreme Court. Uh, the court uh, ruled in 1875 that much of Virginia Minor and Susan B. Anthony's case was in fact correct. Um, that uh, these uh, these people, though they were had the unfortunate, uh, uh, they were unfortunately women. They were in fact persons and therefore citizens and therefore entitled to equal protection of the laws. But what wasn't true is that the right to vote was a uh, was a right and a privilege of citizenship. No, the right to vote was um, a privilege, not a right, and it was. Uh, a privilege that was controlled not by the federal government, but by the separate states. And this should be familiar to all of us who are suffering from this condition today, because it's the states that are responsible for voter suppression. Um, but the suffragists uh, were not, um, the, the fact that the court ruled against them didn't stop them. They decided that if their interpretation of the 15th Amendment was, or the 14th Amendment was no longer acceptable, they would propose their own amendment. And this is what I call the amendment that never was. The woman standing and reading is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, she's standing next to her partner, her lifelong um, political partner, Susan B. Anthony. Um, and this, uh, using the same argument that Anthony and Minor had made, um, she proposed this amendment. You can see it has the same argument. In fact, it sort of, it, it sort of uh, follows the, the logic of the 14th Amendment. The right of suffrage in the United States should be based on citizenship, shall be regulated by Congress, and all citizens of the United States shall enjoy this right equally. And then just the very last phrase has the mark of the woman suffrage movement without any distinction or discrimination, uh, whatever founded on sex. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, uh, the Republicans who controlled Congress were no longer particularly interested in any more constitutional amendments. As Elizabeth Stanton said, uh, the constitutional door had slammed shut where it remained so for the next 40 years. Um, and, um, Although the amendment that never was, was a fleeting part of suffrage history, it illuminates a great deal about the amendment that never was. This is the amendment that was. This is the amendment that replaced the amendment that never was. It was first proposed in uh, 1880, but um, when it was finally enacted uh, 40 years later, finally ratified, it was what we call the 19th Amendment right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged uh, by any state on account of sex. And I've put it this way so you can see it's completely following the language of the 15th Amendment, which made this argument on the grounds of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. I emphasize this because I want to point out the difference between these two amendments, which tell us a great deal not just about women's suffrage, uh, but about the nature of voting rights in the United States. The amendment that never was, was posed in the affirmative. Citizens would have the right to vote. The amendment that was said that states couldn't deny the right to vote uh, on the grounds of, of sex. Uh, the amendment that never was would have, would have established the right to vote for all citizens, regardless of sex. The amendment that was only addresses uh, discrimination by sex, what was called sex then. Um, if the amendment that never was had become a constitutional amendment, and that was an enormous if, it wasn't going to happen, we would now have universal suffrage. And we would be facing the election, this election and others that we have suffered over the past several decades with much greater protections of our right to vote. Um, okay, uh, where is the next page? Yes. Um, 
there is one other aspect of this, this aspect of the suffrage story, and this has to do with race. The pioneers of the women's suffrage movement had come up through uh, what they called the school of anti-slavery. Uh, and the notion of women's right to vote was uh, derived uh, by following the argument for the right to vote of former African, former slave, African-American enslaved men. Um, but um, now uh, in the uh, aftermath of these reconstruction years, um, uh, the country was leaving behind any memory of, um, of the abolitionist and emancipatory heritage. And the same was true of the woman suffrage movement itself. It was coming under the control of a new generation who had no knowledge of and particular sympathy with um, racial equality and the link between gender equality and racial equality. Um, this, this cartoon, it's one of two I'm going to show you from the period that addresses uh, whether black women should have the right to vote. If you look at it carefully, you can see that this is a cartoon that criticizes uh, white suffragists for, as this woman is doing, barring black women from the right to vote. And it's also showing you that this black woman is herself a suffragist. And the white woman is being criticized for being just like the men in what we would call the age of Jim Crow. Um, that said, uh, so for the remainder of the history of, woman, of the woman suffrage movement, for the next 40 years, we, are, we remain in uh, this, this low period of uh, racial politics in this country. We remain in the Jim Crow and black disfranchisement, de facto uh, disfranchisement years. Uh, and so the suffrage movement, which uh, the mainstream suffrage movement, which is controlled by, uh, it's in the hands of white women, it is uh, not particularly welcome of black women and doesn't, um, uh, put its energy into defending the rights of black women. That said, um, perhaps most importantly, is the fact that from the very beginning of the blacks, of the women's suffrage movement, uh, there were black women who fought for the right to vote for themselves and for all women. No women in the United States could know the, the importance of uh, uh, the right to vote more than black women. Uh, because uh, they had watched their men fight for it, and then they watched their men be deprived of it uh, towards the end of the 19th century. The woman on the left uh, comes from the 1850s. She's from uh, the uh, interracial anti-slavery, women's anti-slavery movement of Philadelphia. The woman on the right, Mary Ann Shad Carey, uh, is from Washington, D.C., um, and she's very active in the 1870s. She's actually Another one of the women who tries to cast her vote, as did Virginia Minor and Susan B. Anthony. And the woman in the middle, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, uh, is uh, from Boston, was from Boston, late 19th, late 19th century. Okay, um, now uh, let us go to surprise number two. Um, so we have left behind the reconstruction years. Again, to quote Elizabeth Stanton, the constitutional door has slammed shut. And in the last quarter of the 19th century, uh, we know how much longer it's gonna take to win women's suffrage, but its advocates did not. They concentrated on two goals. The first of it, the first of these was what we would call using our own terms, growing the base. And here uh, we will find that what is most interesting is that the organization that helped the suffrage movement grow from a small radical movement to a much larger movement attracting much more conventional women was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, the Women's Christian, Christian Temperance, I, I, I didn't talk about this image. I use it to show that the uh, stereotypical face of American women in these years was of course white, 
Protestant, pious, and domestic. Hardly anybody who might be considered, might be interested in the right to vote, not anybody who could be moved, not a person who could be moved by arguments of uh, uh, justice or equal rights. So how are we gonna make those women uh, care about woman suffrage? The Women's Christian Temperance Union is most usually remembered in American uh, history, uh, not very positively as this cartoon from the period shows, shows of uh, women, um, like this woman carrying a hatchet, uh, who is, uh, who is uh, determined to deprive men of their, one of their few privileges, that of throwing back a beer or two, uh, instead of being stuck at home with the old ball and chain. Um, and, um, uh, but in fact, the WCTU was the largest women's organization in the late 19th century. It actually was more open to black women than the suffrage movement itself. Um, and um, it was the first organization outside of the small suffrage societies to support women's suffrage. Now, why are women initially drawn into the temperance movement? You can probably anticipate me here. Uh, the argument here, which still makes a lot of sense to us, is that the abuse of alcohol, uh, which is done more often by men than by women, um, uh, is, uh, um, leads to the suffering of women and children. Uh, both because, as the uh, caption below says, men will drink up the wa their wages at the bar. As she says, how am I going to pay the landlord and buy food for the children? And also because under the influence of liquor, um, he's, he's becoming violent towards her. This is an argument that's not crazy to us even today. Okay. Now, what the question is, how did um, the women who believed this about the temperance movement become supporters of women's suffrage? And the answer is this woman. Her name was Frances Willard. Few of us know her name, but she was the most famous woman in the late 19th century. She was the president of the WCTU. Um, I love this picture on the right. It comes from a little book she wrote called How I Learned to Ride the Bicycle. Uh, bicycles were really important to women of this period. It was, it gave them freedom of movement, sort of like the automobile did uh, 40 or 50 years later for women. And Frances Willard, who was a feminist in her heart of hearts, appreciated this and became determined to learn to ride the bike. You can see from this picture, you know, we were, we were held up in our bicycles and our two wheelers by our fathers. She's being held up by younger women. She doesn't look all that comfortable, but she did learn how to ride a bike. And I do like this approach. I mean, this picture of her. Now, um, Willard approached suffrage very different than people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The term woman suffrage had already become tainted as a kind of fearful, radical slogan. So what she did, what Willard did, is she basically rebranded re the issue of woman suffrage and called the right to vote home protection, a home protection ballot. So what she argued was not so much that the right to vote was a matter of abstract justice or equal rights, and it wasn't um, important to women because they had the same rights and the same obligations as men, but rather because women were so different than men, because their obligation and their spheres were so different. Um, and um, now I have to find the paper that I lost. Here we go. Excuse me. Um, her argument was that women needed to, um, although their interests remained uh, in, their, in the domestic sphere, they had to leave their sphere. They had to leave woman's sphere and go outside of the fence, leave behind these trivial concerns like fashion and gossip and go into public so that they could do what was necessary to 
protect their homes, protect their families, and protect their children. Um, now, she died, uh, Willard died in the 1890s. She died quite young. She was in her 50s. And after she died, the WCTU was less influential. But the argument that she pioneered remains important for the suffrage movement. We can see this image from maybe 1907 or 1908, making the same argument that here this woman, and we can see she's from a different, a, a younger, gen, you know, an, a later generation. Her clothes are more modern, her hair is short, uh, her skirt is above her ankles, um, but she's doing the same thing. She is using the ballot <coughs> to dig in the muck of politics and get rid of things that uh, she's concerned with, like on the left, food adulteration. The fact that when she buys milk for her children, it's not clean, it's not reliable. Or uh, the largest of these demons, white slavery, which is traffic in women, trafficking, sexual trafficking. Um, uh, this approach then, that women need, that we can say Willard pioneered, that women needed to vote not just on the grounds of principle or abstract justice, but because there were political issues that women, as women, cared about and that they could use the vote to that end. American women were, uh, were becoming different, not like that image I showed you of the small town uh, white um, uh, domestic woman in her, in her home. Uh, American women in the early 20th century were becoming more urban, as was America, more urban, uh, less Protestant and more Catholic and Jewish, less native born, more immigrant, and less exclusively domestic and more wage earning. Uh, by the early 20th century, something like one quarter of the industrial labor force was female. So I show you these two pictures. They're by famous photojournalists of the early 20th century to illustrate the kinds of issues that brought 20th century women into the suffrage movement. On the left, this is a period uh, a photograph by Jacob Reese, I believe. And here we see children in New York. Uh, since there are no um, playgrounds for them to play in, they are playing next to a dead horse. Um, and then on the right, and this is a, a photograph by Lewis Hines, we can see women workers, or probably what is more accurate, young girls uh, working for uh, low wages, for long hours, uh, uh, and under conditions which uh, they, are, they have no protections uh, against. And these kinds of issues are bringing women in the 20th century into the suffrage movement. Now we come to the third surprise. I said that in those years that the constitutional door was closed, uh, the suffrage movement pursued two goals. One I said was building their base. The other uh, uh, relied on and exploited the fact uh, that as I indicated, the constitution actually left the right to vote and its control to the states. So in those years, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the suffrage movement went to the states to convince men, voting men, to amend their constitutions to give women the right to vote. Um, by the middle of the teens, uh, something like 14% uh, of American women had the right to vote. And when their states amended their, or uh, when women were under state constitutions, which gave them voting rights, they had full voting rights. They weren't just authorized to vote for their state legislators, but for their federal congressmen and for president. This is a picture of Wyoming women voting. Uh, Wyoming women, sometimes we hear the date 1869, but that was when Wyoming was a territory. Wyoming women get full voting rights when Wyoming comes into the union as a state, which it did with women fully enfranchised in the year 1890. The first state that uh, uh, gave women the right to, or in which women won the right to vote uh, by amendment to a constitution, that is to say by convincing male voters to amend a constitution, is Colorado, three years after Wyoming. 
a larger and more industrial, industrializing state. So this is women going into a Denver uh, polling place. And I just love this picture because, I mean, what is, their, what is their body language and their faces tell you? And the way that they've got their favorite hats perched high on their head, they are absolutely thrilled. And more than thrilled, they feel fully entitled to be voters. Um, this is uh, one of the leaders of the Colorado suffrage movement, an African-American woman named Elizabeth Ensley. Um, she had been a, a, she was on the faculty of Howard University and then she came to be a public health officer in Denver. Um, my own state, California, um, became the sixth of these, they like to call themselves free states. I meant to look up what year uh, Arizona gave women the right to vote. I'm thinking it is 1914, but I couldn't swear to it. Um, so in 1911, California puts the issue of women's suffrage on its, as a state referendum, and they conduct, the suffragists in, Cal in California conduct what I call the first modern suffrage movement. It's modern because it involves a very different, co a, a quite a broad coalition and quite a different one. One that uh, ranges across classes from college women uh, to wage earning women, equal pay for equal work regardless of sex, and also across races. Um, <clears throat> the uh, woman on the right of whom I don't know a lot was an African-American woman from Oakland. And there weren't a lot of black women in, um, in California, but nonetheless, she was someone who organized black, black uh, support for the, uh, the referendum. Uh, the woman in the middle is a Chinese woman named Clara Lee. Um, there are very few of these women because they have to be, first of all, they have to be native born. A federal law prohibited uh, Chinese uh, immigrants from being naturalized. And uh, they had to somehow get through the state bans against um, mixed race marriages, miscegenation. Um, and then finally, uh, the lone suffragist that I could find who uh, was a Hispanic woman. Um, her family had come to uh, the Los Angeles area before statehood uh, in 1847. She was a highly educated woman. She was the first Spanish speaking woman to uh, teach at what was called the Southern uh, Branch of the University of California. That's what is now UCLA. Um, and she worked very hard to spread the suffrage um, uh, issue to uh, a Hispanic, to Spanish speaking voters. Now, um, I have learned because people have asked me a lot about voter suppression. Um, there was a, uh, uh, voters in California were required to be able to prove that they could speak English. So this would have been an obstacle to Hispanic uh, citizens. Um, but, uh, she, you know, she nonetheless campaigned for the issue of suffrage among uh, the, the men of her state. Uh, the California movement was also modern in that it used all kinds of technology. It used movies. It used automobiles. Here we see women uh, having driven uh, from uh, probably San Francisco to a small town uh, in the uh, uh, driving into the Central Square. One woman toots her horn. Uh, and the other woman stands up to give her suffrage speech. Um, and uh, finally, um, it, was, it was visually a very modern movement. Uh, this was because it was important. You know, I talked about how Willard had rebranded suffrage. Suffrage was rebranded again, and the women of this, early, of this early 20th century period start calling themselves not women's suffrage, which has this old fashioned musty name. They call their movement votes for women. And this woman uh, who uh, is, this is, this is a poster, that won, uh, the, won a, won a uh, contest for the leading poster in California uh, in 1911. Um, it's a beautiful poster. 
Um, you can see she's modern, her hair is short. Uh, you can see she's wearing a very modern sort of Art Nouveau outfit. And she's standing in front of the Golden Gate where there isn't a bridge yet, but she is in fact standing in front of the setting sun. Now, um, this way of enfranchising women state by state uh, had a lot of success. As I said, something like 14% of the women of the United States could vote and could vote in federal elections, could vote for president of the United States uh, by the middle of the 1910s. But it could never enfranchise all women of the United States because the former Confederate states would do everything in their power, which was a lot, to keep uh, uh, their states from passing any kind of suffrage amendments. This is because they had finally succeeded in tearing the vote away from uh, black men, and they were not going to allow black women to vote. Um, I told you before that that prior cartoon was one that criticized the suffrage movement for its obstacles to black women. Here you can see a cartoon that uh, tries to show how dangerous, uh, how unacceptable it would be for uh, women to gain the right to vote because these colored ladies uh, would uh, come, uh, who, who barely look like women, look at their shoes, their stereotypes, um, and um, they're going to terrify white women, and it is they who are going to gain the right to vote. So uh, no Southern state is going to allow that to happen. The opposition to Black women voting in the late 19th century in these Southern, Southeastern states uh, has everything to do with the fact that Black women have become much better organized and much more determined to play their role in winning the right to vote. Uh, so we have here on the left uh, the, color, uh, the California State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Uh, and we have here on the right the most famous Black woman activist and suffragist of this period, uh, a, a uh, campaigner against lynching, Ida B. Wells. We can talk about her later if you'd like. Now, ultimately, um, the most important uh, impact of the uh, votes of the growing numbers of enfranchised women, um, the 14% of women who could uh, vote in federal elections by the middle of the 1910s, was that they could theoretically use their votes to force uh, the, fed, the leaders of the national government to open the constitutional door and grant suffrage as a constitutional amendment to the federal constitution. Uh, now, in these years, from 1912 to 1920, the president of the United States is a Democrat, uh, and he is the famous Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, reputation has taken a real serious hit because it's become clear uh, how, how much of a Southerner he was and how much uh, he, was, <clears throat> he was responsible for removing what uh, African-Americans there were in the federal service. And he was also, for that reason, because he was a Southerner uh, and also because of his own character, he was completely opposed to, for a long time, for, uh, to open the constitutional door to a federal amendment uh, for, uh, uh, for women's suffrage. Um, a, a branch of the suffrage movement known as the National Women's Party, Women's Party, um, decides to do its best to mobilize against, uh, against Wilson. And they actually attempt to defeat him in his reelection campaign in 1916. Uh, their, their, um, their tool, they believed, was the votes of these women who should be convinced to use their votes so that they could help the women of the nation by voting against the party that opposes women's suffrage. Uh, and it turned out to be a narrow election. And uh, Wilson was narrowly reelected. But he had an issue that trumped women's suffrage. And this was the war the European war, the Great War. Uh, 
um, he, he went to the voters saying that if you elect me, uh, I will keep the country out of the war. Um, it turned out he didn't do that. And uh, in fact, the United States joined the European war uh, just a month after he was, he, he was inaugurated for the second time. Once <clears throat> he's reelected, uh, the National Women's Party uh, can't use women's votes uh, against him. So they started to use the tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience. And they become the first important um, social justice movement to pick the White House, which they do day after day from January all the way through to the summer. Um, they, uh, as Wilson uh, begins to talk about bring, bringing the United States into the uh, Great War in order to protect democracy so, so that it would be a war um, <clears throat> to defend democracy, their argument is He's no defender of democracy, and this country isn't a democracy. Um, this part of the story is among the better known, and I'm going to jump over it because I got a lot to do. Um, I really think that as thrilling as these picketers were, uh, and as bold as they were to be arrested and force fed, the real turning point was in November of 1917, finally. Uh, these campaigns to uh, amend state constitutions jumped, the, uh, jumped to the east of the uh, Mississippi River. And further than that, uh, suffragists were successful in um, convincing the most populous and powerful state in the Union, New York, to grant the right to vote, the full voting rights to its women. From that point on, the um, a million women in New York State uh, have the right to vote, and also the 46 uh, Congress people who are obligated to the votes of women, New York Congress people, are, are switched to the suffrage category. Very soon after that, um, okay, this, uh, so President Wilson uh, uh, switches to supporting women suffrage. He sees the writing on the wall. Now we come to the fourth surprise. Here I want to emphasize how tough the battle for women's suffrage was in its final years. And I'll try and get through this quickly. Two months after um, the uh, uh, New York amended its constitution, the House of Representatives finally uh, entertained and passed a bill initiating the uh, ratification process. And we see here that this bill is being introduced by a woman. She's the first Congresswoman in the United States. She comes from Montana, where women had the right to vote since, 19, uh, since 1914. And she often said that the first vote she ever cast was for herself. Um, uh, and it takes, you have to get two thirds of each house. Uh, so it's tough. And it turned out to be much tougher to get the Senate to pass uh, the bill uh, beginning the ratification campaign. It takes a year and a half. Um, <clears throat> and over those 18 months, uh, suffragists are still short of two crucial votes to win uh, the bill uh, beginning the suffrage campaign. Uh, I'm going to jump over this part because this is about the, in, the, the flu epidemic, which I didn't address in my book because I, I didn't pay any attention to it until we got our own pandemic. Um, and suffragists work through this period and continue to gain victories. And so in, um, in June of 1919, the Senate passes the suffrage amendment. Now suffragists are determined to get this bill passed and the, um, the uh, amendment ratified in time to get women to vote for the 2020 election. That gives them 15 months from September, from June of 1919 to November of 1920. <clears throat> um, the first few uh, states to ratify happened very quickly, then more and then more, and then it slows down. <clears throat> 
So by the uh, early fall of 1920, they're stuck at 35 states and they need 36. This is very tough. This is why we only have, what is it, 28 amendments, 27 amendments. It's not easy to amend the United States Constitution. All of these white states, and they're white for a reason, they are former, most of them are former Confederate states. <coughs> uh, they are, uh, most of them dominated by white supremacist Democratic Party legislators, um, they're never going to enfranchise, they're never going to ratify the 19th Amendment. And then there are two others uh, 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 under the control of very conservative Republicans, Vermont and Connecticut. It turns out that the 36th state, much to many people's surprise, was the border state of Tennessee. Tennessee, unlike other southern states, uh, had two parties. And it was the fact that there was a residual Republican party as well as a dominating Democratic party that made the difference. These are the state legislators of Tennessee in August of 1920. It's very hot. You can't tell because everybody's wearing either suits or full dresses. Um, but <clears throat> this is another famous part of the story. One of the winning votes that uh, led Tennessee to uh, ratify the Constitution, in, uh, ratify the amendment in August of August 18, was this young, handsome fellow, Harry Byrne, who came from the from Eastern Tennessee. He was a Republican, and the legend has it, and you can uh, see that it's not just a legend, that his mother told him to. You can read this at, on the uh, right side told him to be a good boy and uh, give Mrs. Cat her rats, her ratification. And uh, Harry Byrne does that. He doesn't just do it because his mom told him to. He stands by his goal. Uh, uh, Tennessee ratifies. Uh, eight days later, the, uh, uh, the fact that it's ratified is sent to uh, the Secretary of the United, United States Secretary of State. <clears throat> and the woman suffrage amendment becomes the 19th amendment and women began the hard work first of registering and secondly of learning how to vote and to enter politics. So now I'm going to stop sharing and uh, look forward to speaking to you. Terrific, thank you so much, Professor Du Bois. That's quite a lot of ground and uh, important. No, I went very quickly, but no, I, I know important uh, concepts and a, and a difficult history that you compressed into that presentation. We do have some questions that have come in. A reminder to uh, our audience that to use the Q and A function in chat to post some questions. But I'm going to begin with some questions uh, we have. Toward the beginning of your story, you talked about the post Civil War period and Reconstruction. Could you comment on the? Uh, this is a question that came in the controversy and compromise around the 15th Amendment. Yes, this is- Should, uh, should there be an alliance uh, uh, to have enfranchisement for all those uh, by race and by women disenfranchised, or should there be a focus on just gaining the vote for former male? Uh, well, that's why I showed you what I call the amendment that never was, which was a much more capacious amendment. Even if women had succeeded in getting sex in there, along with race, color, and previous condition of servitude, the 15th Amendment was a very weak defense of black men's rights. And even those who agitated for it knew how weak it was. And it turned out to be very weak. Within um, less than a decade, the Supreme Court had begun to authorize ways of getting around this. It, so Southern states wouldn't keep black men from voting because they were black, but because they couldn't pass a literacy test. There were all kinds of what Susan B. Anthony called uh, freaks and cunning devices, petty freaks and cunning devices. Okay, having said that, um, when the 15th Amendment comes up, and it's really only the 15th Amendment, not the 14th Amendment, <clears throat> that one wing of the suffrage movement uh, criticizes and then objects to, um, uh, they do so because they believe, now let me, let me do this fairly, they do so on the one hand because they believe that once this amendment is passed, that's it. But they do this, and this is particularly true of Elizabeth Stanton, 
they do this using very offensive, very racist rhetoric. And it is that rhetoric and those arguments which have um, uh, left particularly Elizabeth Stanton with uh, a, a really tainted legacy. Um, I have to say that their opposition, aside from um, hurting their reputations uh, then and now, had no consequence. It, they had no capacity to interfere with the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which the Republican Party had determined it needed in order to control uh, the uh, government of the former Confederate States. Um, that having said, uh, we jumped from that moment, which is 1870, 1869. Um, as we go forward, let's say we go into the late 70s, we're beginning to move into a different period, a period which we call Jim Crow, and we are beginning to move into a new generation of suffragists who do not have any, uh, uh, any history with uh, anti-slavery. And so when we get to towards the end of the 19th century, um, we have a, a white dominated suffrage movement, which, um, which is not particularly interested in uh, black women's rights to vote. Now, the only actually, uh, I'll call it affirmative efforts to keep black women from voting come from a handful of white suffragists in states like Louisiana and um, Tennessee, who really try to make uh, the, the amendment actually bar, you know, only apply to white women, that fails. And um, so I do think it's important to realize that once we get to the enfranchisement of women in 1920, the barriers to women, and it is true that white suffragists uh, it's certainly one wing of the white suffragists refused to do anything to defend the rights of black women. The real um, power to keep black women from voting comes from the southern states where the majority of them still live. So let's remember that at no time did white women have the power to keep black women from voting. So just me follow up from me before we move on to the next question in the queue. There are such interesting issues here for historical understanding about American right. history or just historical understanding generally, to try to understand these important leaders and actors in their context. Yes, and especially thank you. as political and civic leaders, right? The, the old fashioned phrase, the art of the possible. They're trying to move major issues of state constitutional amendments, federal constitutional amendments, legislation, and they've, they've got to, uh, they can't be thinking about a single issue. You, you just mentioned race, as well as women, as well as temperance and alcohol, and uh, you know this whole. So, could you just comment on on what we might learn today about how to think about the past generally, which a, a major controversy this summer, right, about the American founding and history of race generally in the country? Well, this is hard for me to address. The suffrage movement, the racist um, dimension of the white dominated suffrage movement has gotten more attention than any other aspect of the suffrage legacy, except probably for the fact that there are, of rescuing the reputation of black suffrage, black women suffrage. Um, I'm, I have to say, leading this campaign to emphasize race, both the racism of white suffragists and the presence of black suffragists in the women's suffrage movement has been the New York Times. And this is particularly interesting because the New York Times uh, objected to women's suffrage and the suffrage amendment all the way to the moment that it was ratified. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's subscribed to the racial attitudes of the period. And in none of the current uh, uh, material that the New York Times is putting out, does it ever own up to its own historical legacy? You can see I'm very irritated at this. Uh, but um, I do feel, I do feel that uh, I don't mean to underplay the, the, the several moments in which suffrage leaders 
um, um, evidence and act on very racist attitudes. Um, but um, I do regret that the entire struggle is being reduced to that. So much so that there are people who think that black women didn't gain the right to vote from the 19th Amendment. Now they were kept from, they were, they were, uh, they suffered de facto disfranchisement because of the states in which the majority of them lived. Um, so that's my rant, the end. Okay, another uh, question. Um, it's interesting for us in the 21st century to think that from Elizabeth Cady Stanton through arguments later in the century, the women's suffrage movement generally seems to have confidence in America's founding principles, the Declaration, the Constitution. It just needs to be extended. So the more recent example of this is the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s. Whereas there, there is more of a view today that you know, substantial reform might need to involve moving beyond the founding principles, more, more radical arguments. How do, you, how do you situate the women's suffrage movement across these 75 years that you covered? In well, in the last period, um, in, the, in the progressive era, but both in the reconstruction years and the progressive years, uh, women come, suffragists come up with uh, direct action forms of pressing. Now, let's not forget their goal was to be admitted as citizens with the right to vote. So they can't and they shouldn't have turned their backs on the absolute right to open up, we the people, to them. But having said that, in these two periods of relative uh, progressivism, the Reconstruction period and the Progressive period, they uh, use direct action. Uh, in the 1910s, that involves uh, picketing, uh, that involves uh, getting arrested, uh, that involves force feeding. Uh, and in general, it, the conclusion is that the two wings of the suffrage movement, one that works from the inside and one that works from the outside, are working together. Uh, sometimes it is said that the radicals outside the White House gates are pushing Wilson into the arms of the moderates. Um, uh, I have to say that um, although the courage of the, um, the protesters is, is very moving, in the work I did, I was really taken by the quiet courage of the lobbyists who year after year learn how to um, uh, swallow their, I couldn't do it, uh, when, they, when they are exposed to the humiliation of Congress people saying, they're there, little woman, they, they can't react. They have to say, thank you, uh, Mr. Congressman. They have to leave. And they have to, as they were told, leave the door open for the next person to come in. Uh, I've been on a series of um, webinars with Nancy Pelosi. And Nancy Pelosi seems very much to be in this tradition. I, I would love to be able to get access to her and show her what she rests upon. Um, so um, maybe it's my age, I'm in my 70s. When I was in my 20s and 30s, I probably uh, would be more drawn to the women outside the, the White House gates. But now I'm very drawn to the persistence, the persistence of uh, these women who uh, who stick with really, really difficult um, uh, political environments and constitutional obstacles to get. Yeah, the, pra the practical steps to actually pass legislation or amendments or, yes. It's not a legislation, it's a constitutional amendment. Yes, right, sure, sure, sure. But they're working through legislatures, yes. Right. Um, a question about which you're probably not surprised by, um, the Equal Rights Amendment as the next wave of this um, in, in uh, the la latter part of the 20th century. And what, what, is your, what is your perspective on that, if we are getting a question in relation to this history you just covered for us? All right, so I didn't get a chance because I had to do so much to tell you that what probably many of your listeners will know that the Equal Rights Amendment was first introduced in 1923 
by the remnants of the, not the remnants, by the National Women's Party, uh, out of recognition, and this couldn't be more important, suffragists, um, both the moderates and the radicals, recognized that the right to vote is just the beginning. And, uh, it, you know, the celebration of the centennial, uh, a little bit acts like getting the right to vote did it. It didn't do anything. It, it well, did something. And what it did is it gave women tools uh, to enter into the full stream of politics. Now, it took women a good half century to even begin to consolidate their political power. But having said that, I would say that the difference between the ERA and the 19th Amendment, uh, not their similarities, but the difference was that women are now political actors. Therefore, women as political actors are crucial on both sides of the ERA battle. Um, people ask me a lot about the anti-suffragists. There were women anti-suffragists, but they were just sort of fronts for uh, a larger um, uh, uh, interests opposed to the suffrage. Uh, my friend Gloria Steinem thinks that there's similarities between the two and that um, uh, industries, uh, the insurance industry, industries that rely on paying women less and charging them more, uh, which both oppose the 19th Amendment, she also believes are responsible for the defeat of the ERA. Very good. Um, can I ask you just a quick response to this one? Um, it is interesting that in, in the subsequent century, we have had women governors and U.S. senators and members of the House. A few of them. <laughs> state, state legislatures, secretaries of state, uh, nominees to be vice president, um, nominees to be president, but um, so much of our politics has focused on the presidency in the past year. So do you think there's a, a, a larger historical legacy here behind the fact that uh, women have not been elected to the vice presidency or the presidency per se by this point? Well, um, I just read an article by Hillary in The Atlantic in which, my God, she said, I really hope that a woman is elected to, to be president um, soon. Um, I guess, let's see, what do I think? Well, uh, uh, without making a direct connection to the suffrage movement, you'd think I have an answer to this question by now. Uh, yeah. I think is that um, the 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 um, the uh, vitality that's the wrong word the fact that sexism is so you know it's like it's like a vampire you try to kill it and it comes back up the the enduring quality of sexism uh, is um, certainly the less one of the lessons of of at least our experience with women's battle for higher office. Um, uh, the, we've yet to see uh, what combination of race and gender will get thrown at Kamala Harris, but I, I, look, I don't look forward to it, but no doubt it will be major. Um, but we can also look at the lessons of 2018, uh, which was a midterm election, which is easier. Uh, we're going to have to deal with Trump, Trumpsters in 2020. But uh, in 2018, uh, there was a um, fabulous coalition. And it was women of color were led, were in the leadership of this, as they will be in uh, campaigns to increase the number of uh, women in Congress. So I would say that um, uh, the lesson here, which in some ways is a negative lesson from the suffrage movement, is the importance of coalitions to win these battles. Very interesting. Well, thank you. We have gone a bit over our time because this was so interesting. I have a few uh, closing remarks and, and thanks before a final thank you to you, Professor Du Bois. So uh, we owe a thanks to the Jack Miller Center, which funds our annual Constitution Day lecture and they have for several years. Uh, behind the scenes, we are grateful as always to Dr. Carol McNamara, who is Associate Director for Public Programs for our school, to Joe Martin, our Communications Manager, who in the past few months I have redubbed our Zoom wizard, uh, and to Morgan Raddick from our uh, events team.
doing all the work behind the scenes. Uh, for those interested in uh, our public events and our programming in the Civic Discourse project, our larger project, we have retooled to address uh, the fact that we're in webinar format and to address a current issue uh, of the moment. So we have three webinars coming this fall and we'll have more in the spring on the theme of race, justice, and leadership. Two in October, uh, one on George Washington and his use of uh, slavery and abolition of slavery. And then later in October uh, with Danielle Allen and uh, Peter Myers of the University of Wisconsin on Frederick Douglass and, and race and justice and leadership. And then in November, we'll have a session with Lucas Morrell on Lincoln and race and the fragility of the American Republic. So please do check out the school's website. That's um, skettle, S-C-E-T-L dot A-S-U dot E-D-U. Information on all of our public events, but also on our courses, our curriculum, all the dimensions of our program. We are grateful uh, for this extraordinary document, the United States Constitution. Again, I wish we were with you in person. We'd be distributing copies of our uh, pocket constitution. We're glad to have this opportunity to spread, promote knowledge about it and appreciation of it. And again, thank you to Professor Ellen Dubois of UCLA for this terrific presentation. And uh, my, my pleasure. I, uh, you taught me about Constitution Day. I didn't even know about it. What, what, a, what a holiday. And look for her recent book on the history of women's suffrage. Thank you to everyone. Uh, we hope to see you again at another Skettle public event. Thank you. Good night.